Hey guys, and welcome back to another session of Daniel's Security Academy. Today, we are going to talk about firewall rule sets and some tips and tricks, uh, how you can optimize your firewall rule sets and principles around it, um, the difference between outgoing and incoming rules, uh, what you need to consider here. And um, yeah, it's probably going to be a, a little shorter video, um, but I thought it um, might be very interesting for a lot of you. Uh, who are working in, in the network and network security field um, to get some um, insight on how to tweak uh, file rules as, as there is not a lot of information or videos or articles uh, around there talking about this kind of topic. So um, I'm happy to share my, my knowledge and my perspective on, on things. So let's jump right into it. So let's talk about the principles first. What kind of principles do we have in terms of uh, firewall rule sets? First of all, and the most important one, we have an implicit deny rule at the end of the firewall rule set. So no matter what you are defining on the rules on top, on the bottom is always an implicit denier, which will deny and drop any traffic, which was not a spe uh, specifically uh, whitelisted above this rule. So this is one of the key principles uh, you need to follow, uh, but usually uh, proper firewall solutions will not even allow you to set anything different than the implicit deny rule at the end. So most of the solutions have it by default and you cannot change it. There's nothing uh, you can do about it. It's always an implicit deny, uh, unless of course you uh, actually create an any, any rule um, on top of it. Which brings me to my, my next part, uh, my next principle. Um, do not use any any rules. Like, I mean, um, those kind of rules uh, where you say name, test, um, source any, destination any, any protocol, any service, anything, do whatever you want, any, 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 any. Uh, do not use those kind of rules. I know for testing purposes, it might be uh, helpful and speed up the process. But nothing lives longer than a test rule. Um, in fact, I've seen so many rules uh, which were forgotten to be deleted after the, the testing was over because with the any any rule, uh, for sure the network traffic will work afterwards, at least from a firewall perspective. But yeah, people are usually either forgetting about it or just like, ah, it's okay, no one cares about it. So. Don't even start to build any any rules. Don't build any source, any destination rules, any protocols, any services. Don't, please, don't do this. <laughs> um, another principle is where some firewalls and vendors will differentiate between each other is um, uh, the zone or the interface oriented rule set. So some firewalls are orienting their, their rule set around zones security zones. For example, Palo Alto is doing this. So you define zones where, um, which are attached to interfaces, for example, and in those kind of zones, you define your rule. Um, other um, vendors, for example, Forti uh, do, does it by default by using interfaces. So based on the interface um, you have as the source interface, um, it is grouped. Uh, you can um, remove this kind of um, orientation or displaying uh, in Fortinet, for example, uh, but still by default it is uh, oriented in this way, which is not very different to what the Palo Alto approach is, because in the end it is just this uh, intermediate layer in Palo Alto, where the, which they call security zones, but in the end it's also um, oriented on an interface, but just with the intermediate set of a security zone defined. And uh, last principle I have, um, which is uh, not as common as it should be, is using uh, user and group-based uh, rules instead of IP-based rules. Um, IP-based rules is probably what you all know. You have an IP address, a source IP address, which wants to talk to a destination IP address. You might even work with, um, with host names, with DNS names instead of uh, actual IP addresses. So you have some kind of dynamic in here. Um, but yeah, most of your rule set is probably very static um, in terms of uh, IP addresses to IP addresses. What you wanna 
uh, consider for the future is a lot of rules can be broken down to specific users or user groups. For example, if you want to allow um, your employees to access your finance systems, um, make a file rule which uh, includes the group uh, from the Active Directory, for example, which uh, is for the finance uh, people, um, maybe using um, a group which is defining roles uh, or rule um, permissions. There's, there's multiple um, approaches you can take here, but, but use a group which is specific to um, a subset of, of, of users which should be able to access something. So instead of just saying, okay, all employees are able to access the finance systems, you break it down to, okay, the user group of finance accounting people are able to um, access it. And if you need to um, add specific users, for example, um, you have um, an external auditor um, which needs access to the system, you can add it temporarily. You can add some users permanently because they might be not in, in the role roles of uh, the groups of the finance area but still might need to work on the system maybe like administrators and people patching the systems or whatever uses you can bring up but what i want to uh, give you on here is um, user and group based rules are the ultimate solution on making it very granular who is able to access something and this is pretty much our ultimate goal and the firewall rule set uh, set up Next part, uh, beyond the principles, I want to talk about you um, incoming versus outgoing rules. Um, this is an on section for me because it is important to highlight a few things here. For outgoing rules, um, you don't really need to be very specific. Um, here it is more important that your security features are turned on fully. Um, especially if you want to detect botnets, for example, if you want to detect um, some command and control activity for malware, if you want to de detect some anomalous, uh, uh, anomalies or um, other strange activities from malware, um, the security features will be very important on outgoing rules. But you do not need to define who uh, as a person or as an IP address is able to um, go outside, for example, or um, uh, if you take the example of um, VPN side-to-side -side connections um, between you and a third party, your outgoing rules towards the partner, they don't need to be tied down. You don't care if your traffic, uh, if your users are able to uh, send ping packages over the VPN tunnel or they be able to send some NTP traffic. No, you don't care because it's ultimately the uh, reliability or the, um, uh, the work for the third party to be done on their side to, to reel down um, the incoming traffic on their side. So uh, don't put too much effort in outgoing rules, especially for VPN traffic, unless you don't want to, them to see some traffic, uh, that something is happening, some broadcast, for example, but yeah don't spend too much time on outgoing rules. More importantly, spend a lot of time on incoming rules. So for the incoming rules, it is also very important um, to be specific, especially because I brought up the, uh, the example, um, if you're connecting to a VPN partner. So the traffic coming from your VPN partner towards you needs to be tied down um, very specifically towards the application, the ports, and uh, the destination IPs, which are actually needed. So do not open up your en entire um, infrastructure to your third party. Only the IP addresses, the servers which are needed. And then also only the protocols are which are needed. So if your third party um, partner needs to access a server via SSH, um, only allow the destination IP of the server and SSH as the application. Do not open anything more than that. If ISMP is needed for heartbeat packets to be sent for monitoring purposes, okay, open it up. But if it's not needed, shut it down. You might shut. Um, you might turn it on for um, during the the, the uh, setup phase for, of the VPN tunnel to maybe test the connection between the VPN partners, but delete it as soon as it's not needed anymore. So only what is needed. Least privilege principle. Uh, principle here. 
And the same also applies for the intra-network traffic, uh, which routes through the firewall. Only allow um, very specific what is allowed inside the same uh, security zone. Um, most of the traffic you might not even see because it may be, may be switched um, directly inside the same subnet. But if you have subnets talking to each other and your firewall is the central routing instance, which definitely makes sense, um, then you're going to see the intra um, network and uh, intra zone traffic. And yeah, as, same as for the incoming routes, make it very specific, uh, break it down to what it's needed. So if, for example, you have a ransomware a breakout in a server, it is harder or not even possible to spread across uh, multiple subnets. So all some kind of measures to increase your security posture. Okay, let's talk about optimizations. I already um, gave it in the intro uh, that I want to give you some, some tips and uh, best practices I've, I've learned during my 10 years of experience. And um, yeah, I don't want to keep them for me, so I want to share it with you and uh, I'm very, very open uh, to hear what you think about those and if some of those maybe don't make sense for you or if you have additional optimization. So um, first optimization I have, the most often ru rules should go to the top because a firewall rule set is a sequentially um, processed uh, list pretty much. A packet which comes in will be matched towards the, the rule set and it will go from one to rule 883 um, until it hits the bottom implicit deny if nothing uh, was found which was uh, matching actually. So um, it is very efficient to do if the most often used rules are on the top because a packet will directly be matched to the first rule and the rule set, bam, packet goes. Um, and does not need to go to position 500 something and go 500 positions through the rule set to see, ah, yeah, I match, I go out. So the, on the other hand, it makes sense the less frequent rules should be on the bottom. So some rules which you have because they're like sometimes traffic or just a few sessions on the day, just put it on the bottom, it's okay. They have to go to, through the entire rule set, but there's just a few packets of, of those. Additionally, to something which you put uh, on top of your rule set, it kind of depends also on what kind of firewall you have and um, how the firewall is working. But if you have those kind of no lock rules, so those rules where you um, say, okay, I don't want to lock this traffic, this specific traffic. For example, I don't want to see DNS packets. I don't want to see ISMP packets between my monitoring system and all my network infrastructure. SMP uh, packets, all those kind of things which uh, you know is working, which you don't really know to see on your, on your firewall lock all day. Um, those kind of no lock rules need to go on top as well, of course, because um, if it's, uh, those rules are on the bottom, um, the actual allowing rules already uh, matching so it will be locked everything again so those kind of rules go to the top and here same as uh, with the other um, thing I mentioned before the most often um, used um, rule goes to the top and the less frequently used goes to the bottom of the no lock rule uh, blocks but you need to watch out for both like shadowing um, other um, rules uh, some firewalls um, actually try to stop you from doing shadowing rules because they would say, oh, this rule one shadows rule 17 on the bottom, uh, partially or fully, and might not even be uh, uh, allowing you to commit uh, if you don't um, do some advanced settings on the firewall, like for example, uh, 40, um, you need to um, unmark uh, some check marks um, so you can actually do shadowing of the rules. But also, um, on the other hand, shadowing is not necessarily bad. Um, it is just something which will pop up every time you commit um, a firewall root set. The other part, which is more um, important, watch out that you don't overwrite something. So do not um, have a, a no lock rule for ISMP and say any, any uh, ISMP allow no lock, because this will mean that everyone and every uh, system will be able to ping each other. But if you have some rules uh, on, uh, later on where you say like, okay, I wanna allow a ping for those kind of sources and destinations, but I don't wanna do it for all the others, uh, you might override it with your no log rule. So 
uh, be careful with this one that you do not overwrite what you actually want to um, have in your rule set. Um, next thing is um, also a commonly used thing, but I still want to highlight it. Make use of objects inside the, the rule set. It makes uh, the rule set more readable and more reusable. So instead of putting the IP addresses of your SNMP servers or your radio servers, um, just do an object per radio server and then do a group, call it radio servers, and just use this kind of object group instead of the, the single IP addresses. Because it is easier for you um, to understand the, the names of the objects than um, seeing the IP addresses. Yeah, of course, if you're a network engineer, uh, you will probably have, I don't know, 200, 250 IP addresses uh, by heart, uh, where you just recognize, okay, this is the radio server, I, I know this already. But um, make it easier for everyone, maybe for, for new starters in your company to understand the rule set. Uh, and if you use names uh, of objects, it's definitely making it easier. It is also a balance act between security features activated and the performance. So if you do not have any kind of performance issue, turn on all security features on, uh, like application control, botnet detection, antivirus, whatever you have uh, licensed for your firewall, turn it on and um, make sure it's properly configured and doesn't block your uh, actual traffic, but make use of it. However, um, if you are experiencing already a lot of um, load on your firewall, um, you might want to consider that, for example, for those no log rules, you just turn off all the security features and maybe just do some certificate, certificate inspection and application control. Maybe just two of those uh, security profiles um, which you, you actually can have from the huge set of, of features you have. Um, yeah, it is just a balance act. Um, sometimes uh, you might need this because your firewall is already uh, scratching at the 80% or 90% mark of CPU usage or memory, uh, especially CPU usage is important here. Um, important fact here, if your firewall is running at the 80% of CPU usage, um, watch out that uh, you do not go much higher because some firewalls will actually go into like a fail open state once they maybe reach like 85 or 90% of CPU usage. So watch out if you have this kind of high usage. And, and as a continuous process, monitor the usage of your rules and uh, maybe reorder the rule set as needed. So if you see like another rule hits more, um, has more hits right now because uh, some changes in the infrastructure happened, um, yeah, just move the, the rule uh, to the top and um, yeah, make your rule set more efficient um, for the firewall so packets can be processed faster and yeah, makes it often uh, also uh, easier to read uh, because um, the most uh, often used rules will be also most often reviewed by you. Okay, that's already it for um, the video around the firewall rule set. Uh, apparently I talked definitely longer than I expected, uh, seeing the timer now on, on the camera. Um, I hope the video was interesting. Um, let me know what you think, what your experience is uh, in the firewall field. And I always appreciate your feedback and um, I'm happy to see you in the comment section. And um, yeah, I hope to see you in the next videos. Uh, please subscribe, it really helps me. And um, stay safe and bye bye. Thank you.